friends. I don't remember much about my childhood, like most people. Those memories are always vague and eventually you realize whatever you remember is probably just a reconstructed memory. You don't have much choice in the matter, and are usually convinced that your memory would never fail you. The first memory I have was when I was five. I'm not sure if it's real or not, but that's when I think I met Michael. I never had any friends, so I was glad when I met him. He called me Jack, and I liked it. As uncertain I am if I remember our first encounter, there is no doubting the strong bond we immediately formed. I won't bore you with the details of what we did every day for the past few years, but I will outline some of the things we did together, to assure even the most skeptical among the readers of our friendship. Michael, being a slightly effeminate child didn't have many friends at school either. He was bullied, and the highlight of his day was coming home and sharing a cup of tea with me, all the while telling me of his woes and lessening his burden. The tea, unlike my words of consolation, was make-believe. Another one of his favorite activities was cutting my hair. He would style it in all sorts of ways and I enjoyed each one of them. Fortunately for him, my hair grew inexplicably fast and he often got a chance to restyle it. There was one thing that constantly strained our relationship, though. Don't get me wrong, Michael and I had absolutely no hard feeling towards each other. It was his parents. I don't think they approved of me, and I couldn't tell you why even if I tried. It wasn't just disapproval. I began to think they hated me. The longer our friendship lasted, the worse it got. It pains me to even think about it, so I won't dwell on this for long. As quickly as our relationship had initially flourished, it began to diminish after two years. Michael grew to become a stocky football player, and I remained exactly the same as before, scrawny and completely incapable of competing athletically. He made new friends and started to ignore me. This hurt me a lot, especially since I was there for him in his time of need. His abandoning me was the last thing I expected, and it hit me hard. I felt like I had no one left in the world. As I sit in the corner of the room and write this, I can see Michael and his friends watching TV. Sometimes it seems like he notices me and looks my way, but I know better. I have now resigned to my fate. He created me, but forgot to destroy me. Stairs In 1984, there lived an old widowed lady by herself in a two-story house who was completely immobile and bound to her wheelchair. Ever since the mysterious death of her husband, she required the aid of a carer who would visit her daily to help her with everyday tasks. What made it even more difficult was the fact that the two floors of the house were only connected by an old staircase inside. When the old lady needed to move between the two, the carer would have to carry her frail body like an infant up and down the stairs. One day the police received a call from the widow. There had been a murder. Since police units were scarce at the time, and the murderer had already fled the scene, only one detective was sent out to conduct the initial crime scene report. He arrived to see the carer's body splayed out on the floor with her vocal cords ripped out in a pool of blood on the first level of the house, with the old lady atop the staircase in her wheelchair watching him, still and silently, seemingly in shock. He could immediately rule her out as a suspect, due to her inability to move up and down the stairs, and because she was trapped up there the time the murder took place. It was similar to the death of her husband many years ago, who had suffocated in his sleep on the couch downstairs. The detective put on his gloves, took photos, swabbed for evidence, and covered the body until the coroner arrived later. All routine business. He scoped the house downstairs for any clues then asked the old lady if he could look upstairs. She insisted that she was upstairs the whole time, and no one apart from her had been up there that day. But regardless of this the detective ascended the staircase to which she hesitantly moved aside. Beyond the staircase, there was a narrow corridor, with three closed doors along it. He checked behind each of the doors, the empty bedroom, nothing, the bathroom nothing. He became anxious as he slowly made his way to the final bedroom where the old lady slept. He opened it, and everything looked normal. A bed, a wardrobe and a bedside table with a lamp. He checked every wall of the room in horror, as it was not what he discovered, 
But it was what he didn't discover that made him stop dead in his tracks and slowly reach for his gun in its holster. It was a detail so minor that they had completely overlooked it on the last investigation of the husband's death. There was no phone upstairs. He suddenly heard a noise as he withdrew his gun and rushed out of the room, only to find an empty wheelchair atop the stairs. Lightning We had just moved into a little ranch house in the suburbs. Storybook neighborhood. Quiet, friendly neighbors, picket fences, the whole nine yards. Suffice it to say that this was supposed to be a new start for me, a recently single dad, and my three-year-old son. A time to move on from the previous year's drama and stress. I viewed the thunderstorm as a metaphor for this fresh start, one last show of theatrics before the dirt and grime of the past would be washed away. My son loved it anyway, even with the power out. It was the first big storm he'd ever seen. Flashes of lightning flooded the bare rooms of our house, imparting unpacked boxes with long creeping shadows, and he jumped and squealed as the thunder boomed. It was well past his bedtime before he finally settled down enough to go to sleep. The next morning I found him awake in bed and smiling. I watched the lightning at my window, he proudly announced. A few mornings later, he told me the same thing. You're silly, I said. It didn't storm last night, you were only dreaming. Oh, he seemed somewhat disheartened. I ruffled his hair and told him not to worry, there should be another storm soon. Then it became a pattern. He would tell me how he watched the lightning outside his window at least twice a week, despite there being no storms. Recurring dreams of that first memorable thunderstorm, I figured. It's easy to hate myself in hindsight. Everybody assures me there's nothing I could have done, no way I could have known. But I'm supposed to be the guardian of my child, and these are useless words of comfort. I constantly relive that morning, making my coffee, pouring milk over my cereal, and picking up the newspaper to read about the pedophile local authorities had just arrested. It was front page stuff. Apparently this guy would select a young target, usually a boy, stake out their house for a while, and take flash photos of them through their window while they slept. Sometimes he did more. My stomach sank as the connection was made. At the time, it was merely something from a child's imagination. In retrospect, it is the scariest thing I've ever heard. About a week before the predator was caught, my son came up to me in his pajamas. Guess what? He asked. What? No more lightning at my window. I played along. Oh, that's nice. It finally died down, huh? No. Now it's in my closet. I've yet to see the photos police have collected. 